Um, and this idea of uh, forming a coalition uh, to create a majority in Parliament after an election is the second way of doing it. The difference between these two answers affects the way the Crown has to say the government relates to the Parliament. Minority government is generally preferred by a single party that wants to pursue its own uh, platform promises as far as it can without renegotiating that platform. Coalition governments generally have to renegotiate a new kind of political agenda, platform, if you like, after the election when they form a government. And you can see this in Europe where sometimes it can take uh, months, in one government's case, uh, to form a government before they could agree on a joint platform, if you like. So you can see the difference that this produces uh, in the power sharing issue. Minority government means the executive has to share power with the parliament, so its agenda can be passed with the support of the parliament. Coalition government means that the executive dominance is assured, but the power has to be shared between the parties who make up the coalition. So what's the Tasmanian record? What does it tell us? Eight out of the 19 elections since World War II have produced non-majority outcomes, and they've ruled for 24 of the 64 years. So this means for you who are doing the mass, about 42% of the elections have produced uh, non-majority governments, and they've governed for about 38% of the time. Although they've governed for slightly less than the average uh, time, uh, two out of the three longest serving governments in this period of time were minority governments. Now the point I made about Canada in the early er, applies to Tasmania. The, only one of these eight minority governments was in fact a coalition, and that was the Liberal Centre Party coalition of 69 to 72. What are the implications of this for power sharing in 2010? Well, if you go on the historical record, the likelihood is that if there is a non-majority outcome, there will be a minority government. It is possible, but less likely, that there will be a coalition government. And I think what most of you want to discuss here isn't those two choices, but isn't there something in between? Can't we have our cake and eat it too? Um, Basically, the Westminster system says it's pretty difficult to do, and there, may be, there are a lot of uh, potholes in the road if you try and go that direction. But can't you have something that might look like a Clayton's coalition? Well, there are two possibilities here. It is possible for uh, parties or independents to negotiate some agreement to mutually support a, an executive agenda through the parliament without a formal alliance or coalition. This could the range of here stretches from the Labour Green Accord of 1989 to the present arrangement in South Australia, where the government has a majority but honours commitments made in a previous period to those who supported it when it was in a minority, and so is them now done, uh, so that it operates in a sort of qualified coalition without a majority. As you've just seen, and this is my wrap-up. Uh, this is what some may hope, but it raises all sorts of other questions which I don't have time to answer, but I'll leave, look forward to question time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Our next speaker is Margaret Re Reynolds. Margaret's got a varied background, um, has had a varied background in politics, but now works locally to ensure that Tasmanians living with disabilities are included in the democratic process. She was actually born in Launceston, trained at the University of Tasmania, went on to a, a huge range of positions, um, has worked extensively in social uh, policy development and advocacy at um, all levels of government. Um, some of us remember Margaret as a federal minister for local government, and the status of women in the late 80s. She has also represented Australian government on the Council for Ab Aboriginal Reconciliation. She's worked at the uh, United Nations level. Um, she's taught human rights and international politics in Queensland. Currently, she's adjunct associate professor at the University of Tasmania. And um, she published a book in 2007, Living Politics, which traces her career. Um, and it's been published by University of Queensland Press. So thank you, Margaret, for coming tonight. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. And it's good to be here to uh, discuss this important issue. 
I must admit, I feel something of a, a ringing because I have only ever been uh, a member of majority decision making. Uh, so I sort of feel I, I have to make that as a confession to you first up. Uh, I was a member of a, a Labor Council in North Queensland for four years and I was a member of both uh, of Hawke and Keating governments in the 1980s and 1990s. So, you know, if you feel like saying, get off the stage, you don't know anything about, about power sharing, I would understand from your point of view. But I hope I can uh, persuade you that in actual fact, because of that experience, I do know, uh, or I certainly have views about the way uh, minority government could, uh, could and perhaps should in some instances operate. I guess that for me, uh, there are a number of issues that first come to the question of formal and informal power sharing. Now, informal power sharing is something that all governments, uh, whoever they are, wherever they are, should practice. And by power sharing, I mean power sharing with the opposition parties and indeed with the people they represent. Sadly, I have to say, as a former member of the majority government, uh, that, is not all, that is not the culture of Australian democracy. It's partly, I think, the, uh, the very tight control of the party system, and uh, there is a concern that if there is too much sharing of uh, that, that responsibility in decision making, the party agenda will be lost. I'll give you an example of soon after I was elected uh, to the Senate, uh, an elderly gentleman came into my office and he uh, had made an appointment to see me. And he came in and he glared at me and he said, I suppose I'm wasting the time. And I said, oh, well, you know, sit down, would you like a cup of tea? And uh, I didn't vote for you. Uh, don't think much of you or you, and off he went. And so I sort of, I should have shown him the door, you might be thinking, but I thought, no, he's entitled to his views. And when he got all this off his chest, he said, um, well, here's the problem, but I don't think you can do anything for me. And when I said, well, look, uh, mate, I probably said, being a, a good Labour girl at that time, I said, look, um, I know you didn't vote for me, but now that I'm there, you know, it's my responsibility to represent everyone. It's not just, I don't just represent people who voted for me. I'm a Labour, uh, a Queensland Labour Senator, but I have to represent everyone. And, I mean, he was a friend for life after that. Uh, and I think that if, if we could have more of that attitude uh, officially from governments, it would give, uh, it would give the people much more faith in our democracy. So what do I think of uh, informal power sharing? I think that, for instance, I know that uh, 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 Prime Minister Rudd has been criticised for involving Peter Costello and uh, Brendan Nelson in uh, opportunities to serve uh, Australia in a number of capac in different capacities. And there's been criticism of that. Uh, and I must confess, if you said we're going to, that the, there's going to be an appointment of John Howard to head up the Immigration Review Tribunal, I would have to grit my teeth and say no. But I think we have to commend the way in which Kevin Rudd has been prepared to offer that commitment to, to uh, recognise the skills and talents of those two leaders, uh, even though they have come from a very different political philosophy.